Kion, are you here? I'm right here, Greg. Where? I, I don't see you. All I see is that purple couch. Oh, that's me. Hold on, I'll rearrange. Keep in mind that ever since I turned into an octopus, I can change my shape and color almost any way I want. This is what I wanted to talk about. Our relationship. Things are really different now that you- Wait, aren't you forgetting something? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Fishy. See, I shouldn't have to give you a fish every time I want to talk to you. Fishy! Okay, here's a fish. Now turn your back. I don't want anyone to see my mouth. Okay, just for example, it's weird that your mouth is mm. under your armpit. Mm. That's an example of the kind of thing that's hard to get used to. I'm just wondering if maybe it would be nicer for you to meet an octopus you could breed with. And maybe... Wait a minute. Are you breaking up with me? Uh, you could say that. See, that's another thing that I hate when you squirt me with that uh, spouty thing. It's not called a spouty thing, it's called a funnel. Really, Greg, it speaks volumes that you've never learned the proper names for my octopus parts. I've got 130 million brain neurons, you've got 100 billion, but you can't remember funnel. But I know the name for the thing, you know, the, the thing on your, your body that, you know what I'm talking about. You're forgetting, aren't you? You're becoming more and more one of them. You'll never understand the stuff I think about these days. I wouldn't even know how to translate it for you. Maybe you should just listen to this, what are they called, noisy, talking, land thing. And now, this is a joke we octopuses love, there's a sucker born every minute. Want to meet one? Colin McEnroe. Suckers! Do you see what I did there? Is this thing even on? An octopus audience would be laughing their heads off if they, you know, had heads. Well, they do. They do and they don't have heads. I, I think that's fair to say. They have things that we call heads. Uh, but when you get start talking about octopuses and their anatomy, it gets very complicated. And it's about to get very complicated. But I think, and I hope in a delightful way, as we do our full show salute to the octopus and uh, guiding us along through this, uh, we have Cy Montgomery, the author of nearly 20 books for adults and children, including The Soul of an Octopus, a surprising exploration into the, well, let me see, I have the wrong subtitle, a surprising exploration into the wonder of consciousness. Uh, and also joining us is David Scheel, uh, a marine biologist and behavior ecologist at Alaska Pacific University. Uh, he appears in Simon Montgomery's book, and he has a forthcoming book on the behavioral ecology of marine animals. A little bit later, we're going to talk about the somewhat touchy subject of just how dang delicious octopuses are. Uh, once you get to know a little bit more about them, you may be less comfortable. I don't know if you're comfortable eating them right now. I I have been until about two days ago. Um, and I can even tell you where to get really good octopus. But now I'm not feeling really so great about that. And you'll find out why in just a second as you meet both Cy and David. So, Cy Montgomery, first of all, welcome to our show. Delighted to be here. And um, maybe the first thing to do is just kind of uh, take us through a little bit of octopus anatomy. This is a really, really complicated creature. Its its life uh, and its body are not organized in a way that particularly closely parallels parallels the way humans or really most vertebrates are. So uh, give us a little a quick guided tour of an octopus. Well, happy to do that because you would have to go to outer space or science fiction to get an animal more unlike us. You know, we go head, body, limbs. They go body, head, limbs. And as you pointed out, their mouths are in their armpits. They can taste with all their skin. They can change color and shape. They have three hearts. They have blue blood. They have a beak like a parrot. They have venom like a snake, and they have ink like an old-fashioned pen. So that, for starters, should tell you that you are dealing with a creature who seems so alien. And yet, they're a marine invertebrate, and most of life on this planet is a marine invertebrate. On the other hand, I get the feeling, um, reading your book, that among invertebrates, there's sort of octopuses and there's everybody else, right? I mean, there's, um, I mean, what we're going to be talking about here in terms of their level of personality, dis ability to discern among human beings, intelligence. I don't get the feeling there's another invertebrate that's somewhere close to them on the Iowa Basic Invertebrate Skills <laughs> Test. <laughs> You're right. In fact, um, they just finished sequencing the octopus genome and found that, yes, it really was unlike anything else that they had 
ever ever seen in the mollusk family. These guys, it's hard to believe, but they are mollusks like clams and snails. But clams, for example, don't even have a brain. Oh, but the octopus brain, I should mention, this was one of the anatomical features I didn't touch on. Instead of being like our brain, like a a, a walnut in its shell, first there's no shell because there's no skull, but their brain wraps around the throat. And instead of having four big parts or lobes, they have between 50 and 75, depending on how you count the lobe and which of the 250 plus species of octopus you're talking about. Well, yeah. And David Shield, let me throw you into the conversation here, too. So this uh, raises interesting distingu- uh, distinguishing features between what we would think of as our brain and the octopus's brain. For example, what can happen with an octopus tentacle if it's severed from the rest of the octopus? Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, these tentacles can briefly, anyway, exhibit almost a kind of autonomy when they're not part of the octopus. Do I have that right? Yes. Uh, about two-thirds of the octopus's uh, central nervous system is located outside of its uh, brain, um, so that's not like humans. Humans have, uh, I, I don't know the exact figure actually, but, but quite uh, a, a large proportion, the majority of their neurons are actually located in their brain. And so with the octopuses, uh, they can perform a, a lot of sort of complicated feats with their arms and suckers, even if the uh, brain is no longer attached. And so, uh, they, the, the suckers will hand off anything they contact, they'll, They'll adhere to it and then hand it off to the next neighboring sucker towards the mouth. And so things will get passed down the arm, for example. And if you put the arm on a um, a flat surface, it will look like it's crawling along as each sucker contacts the surface and passes it along towards the sucker um, nearest to the nearer to the mouth than it is, it will gradually crawl along the surface as though the arm were still exploring. Right. So in other words, uh, w- the way that an octopus typically eats is the way that you just described. But in this case, the, the, um, the suckers are passing food towards a phantom mouth, a mouth that's basically not there. The, the arm doesn't necessarily know that uh, because it's not you know, connected anymore, but it's acting as though it's connected. I, th- that, to me, that's amazing. And Sai, as long as we're talking about things that are located uh, you know, on the octopus's skin, one of the things that uh, I found fascinating about your book, we know that octopuses, the color is really important to the world of the octopus. The octopus, as was suggested in the introduction, can change into myriad different colors depending on, on what its needs are in a given situation and what its moods are. We can talk about that. But the, it turns out the eyes, the, the actual eyes of the octopus are not what see color, right? Yeah, this is amazing. At least we haven't figured out a way that the eyes can see color. But recently it was discovered that octopuses have in their skin a protein called opsin. And it's possible, and David as a scientist may be able to speak better about this than I, it's possible that not only can they taste with their skin, not only can they change color with their skin, but they may be able to see with their skin. Yeah, David, you want to say anything more about that? Uh, Sure. Um Sure. Uh, you know, most of the time when we're trying to figure out how animals sense something, what, is, what does an animal know? It's kind of a mystery because they can't really tell us. And so we've, as scientists, we kind of developed a number of different ways to ask the animal what they can see. And one of them is the one that Sai just described. We take a look at what kinds of proteins are, are present. And uh, light-sensing proteins are typically present in animals in the eyes, but octopuses have them in their skin. Uh, but another thing we can do, and so that's been established. Another thing we can do is we can we can ask them behaviorally. Uh, can you use your eyes to tell this from that? Uh, and then there's a third way we can do it, which we can look at it neuronally. We can put uh, very sensitive, thin, thin wires into a nerve cell, and then ask when we shine light on this nerve cell, does it respond as though it has received information? So we have sort of three levels. What kind of structures are present? What kind of nervous activity occurs? And what sort of behavior can we see? The, for whether octopuses can see with their skin or not, we've done the first one. So we know that octopuses have the structures present that might be able to detect light. But we haven't done the other two. So we haven't checked for neuronal activity in the presence of light uh, that varies with the light. And we haven't checked whether the octopuses can modify their behavior based on that light. 
So, Sai, one of the things uh, that uh, you did learn in a very personal way, and we should say as we go along here, we're going to talk a little, a lot about octopus uh, intelligence, octopus personality, uh, and uh, in the second segment, we're going to talk about the whole question, the thorny question that kind of obsesses us on this show of consciousness. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Sai's book that um, has to do with the soul of an octopus. I mean, whether or not these uh, animals have things that we can identify as selves. Um, so, anyway, we'll come to that. Uh, now I forget. Oh, the eyes. So, in other words, Sai, one of the first experiences that you had that seemed as though it were some kind of exchange is that sense that the eyes look at you and follow you. Tell us about that. Oh, this was an amazing experience, and it's what set me on the road to doing this book. The first time I actually met an octopus was at the New England Aquarium in Boston, and I asked the um, the keeper, actually not his re- the regular keeper, but this was Scott Dowd, the freshwater keeper down the hall, if he would open up the lid and let me meet the octopus. And it struck me that immediately this large animal, like 40-pound animal, comes over, turns color, bright red, and I can see the eye swivel in its socket and lock onto my face. And a lot of animals don't do that. Mm -hmm. And plus, I mean, how would it even know this is a face? My face looks nothing like her face. Her name was Athena. And after she looked at me, I immediately plunged my arms into her tank, into the 47-degree water, and started petting her. And she let me pet her head. And she did this amazing thing. First, she covered my arms and hands with her suckers, so she's not just touching me, but she's tasting me with those suckers, the kind of thing that if a person did it, you'd be alarmed, but, you know, it was an octopus. And the other thing was letting me touch her head was something highly unusual. She didn't normally let people touch her head, and she turned white beneath my touch, which I later learned is the color of a relaxed giant Pacific octopus. So I was quite touched and moved and excited as well because here was somebody who I felt was just as curious about me, just as interested in me as I was interested and excited about meeting her. So this was someone, not something, and I wanted to get to know her better. And this was how the book The Soul of an Octopus really began. So we're talking to Sai Montgomery and uh, David Scheel. Uh, we're talking about octopuses. If you have questions or comments, 860-275-7266, 860-275-7266. We're also very excited about the fact that the famous public radio science blogger, Patrick Scahill, uh, who uh, oversees the Beaker, is like right here in our studios uh, listening to Oh, he's gone. Did he leave? No, he has left. All right. He's mysterious. He's like an octopus. He comes and goes. He can Patrick can squeeze through any hole, too, just like an octopus. He can fit himself through a hole much tinier than you would guess uh, based on his body. Uh, All right. So we're going to talk quite a bit about sort of intelligence and and um, and what, for want of a better word, we'll call personality, although obviously that's kind of an anthropomorphic or anthropocentric word. But um, I I want to begin my some of my favorite stuff, um, Sai, has to do with the necessity of keeping octopuses who are being held in, in aquariums. Um, busy, right? I mean, one of the things that aquarium keepers have learned is that an uh, idle tentacles are, are the devil's playground, uh, <laughs> and so they have to find That's things for so octopuses true. to do, right? Oh, yeah. Otherwise, one, your octopus will escape, and when your octopus escapes, it is bad news for anybody in any adjoining tank because they will go in and eat them. So, yes, it's really important to keep your octopus occupied. Also, because, you know, they're such smart animals. They deserve to have something interesting in their day. So there's actually an enrichment manual that aquariums have to keep their octopuses interested. And they suggest that you give your octopus many of the same toys that we would give our children, like Legos, like Mr. Potato Head. They like to to put things together and to take things apart. And at New England Aquarium, we had no less than an inventor with many patents to his name, Wilson Menashe, who came up with something, a special toy, to keep the octopuses interested. And it was a series of interlocking cubes. Um, You'd put one inside another, inside another, and a live crab in there, and each one would have a different lock. And the octopus figured out every lock every time. 
Well, one of my uh, favorite uh, ones uh, uh, like that was um, a toy that was basically a ball that was that it was in halves, and it had I guess sort of a, a threaded thing where you screw the ball together, the two halves together to make the ball, or you can unscrew them. They put a treat inside the ball, and and an octopus not only unscrewed the ball so it could get the treat, but then it screwed the ball back together again, just just be- <laughs> because it could, that. right? Um, Yeah, absolutely. They love doing that. At Seattle Aquarium, you know, they always name their octopuses. No matter what aquarium you have, even if they don't tell you what the name of the octopus is, they name them because they have such individual personalities. And there was one they named Lucretia McEvil because she constantly dismantled everything in her tank. And the the Aquarius would come in in the morning and everything would be everywhere and they would have to fix it. Wasn't there one octopus, I think his name might have been Otto, who didn't he, was there one who shorted out electrical systems because he was bored, right? Oh, right. And um, I think that was Otto. And there have been others who have, you know, gotten out of their tanks and and flooded whole floors and uh, by sticking their... Their tentacles. They're, I'm sorry. They're actually called arms, but um, sticking their arms into into some valve that plugs something up. There have been octopuses that just kind of got mad at the fact that there were sharks in their tank and just killed them all, um, which they they found out by putting a, a camera, a motion sensing camera, up to find out like why are all the sharks turning up dead? And it turned out it was the octopus. So they do all kinds of amazing stuff. So, David Shield, we're doing a couple of things here that, as a marine biologist, um, you may slightly uh, bridle against. One of them is talking about how octopuses behave in this, what's essentially an artificial environment for them when they're they're not free to go wherever they want to go. Uh, and we're talking about their, their intelligence kind of in human terms, right? This is a natural tendency that we have. This animal is smart because it can do something I can do. Um, when you look as a marine biologist at octopus intelligence, what do you look for? What, what are the indices that are meaningful to you? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't, I study behavior. I don't necessarily study intelligence per se. Um, you know, one of the things about intelligence is it turns out it's hard to define and it's hard to measure. Uh, and that's true even with humans. I mean, we talk about humans and, and whether they have a high IQ or not. But it turns out in, in human intelligence, um, people have begun to talk about sort of five or six or seven different kinds of intelligence, social intelligence, numerical intelligence, um, and so forth. And so I I tend to have taken that message really to heart. It seems to me that animals are going to have many different kinds of intelligence. And if you extend this a little bit further, you could sort of expect that there would be many different dimensions to, for example, personality or even to consciousness. And so to ask, is an animal intelligent? It, does an animal have personality? Is an animal conscious? These are less interesting questions to me than what kinds of intelligence does it have? What kinds of uh, personality or consciousness? And so th- that's kind of how I like to think about this, is what kinds of intelligence do we find? And as Sai has pointed out, octopuses have absolutely uh, stunning sort of mechanical or, or manipulative uh, intelligence and personality and curiosity, and they always want to get their very versatile arms and suckers onto things. They're incredibly tactile, and they're also incredibly visual, and those happen to be two kinds of intelligence that octopuses and humans share. Um, and David, an octopus in the wild, it, 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 it's pretty clear, I think, at least reading Sai's book, learns things, learns how to do things. And that might be a thing that you're interested in, too, that an octopus's behavior in the wild. Well, I mean, there are things that they do, and I'll let you pick one, although I was reading in the book about how they basically cre- they'll create the appearance of extra eyes or something for specific reasons. Maybe you can mention some of the behaviors you see in an octopus in the wild that are useful to it. Sure. Um you know, it's interesting. I spent a lot of years studying octopuses in the wild, and yet uh, in my early years, I seldom saw octopus behavior. Uh, they, they sleep a lot. They, they hide in their dens a lot, and they make themselves as inconspicuous as possible. I've been very fortunate recently to start working uh, at a site out in Australia that is um, where the octopuses are active during the day, and they're out a lot. And I did some work also in Morea 
that had that same characteristic to it, where we were able to see the octopuses out and moving around a lot. And it's really, really exciting and really incredible. Uh, Cy was there uh, on some of our work in Morea. And um, the animals are just so active, and they're so curious, and they move around sort of flowing like, like ink almost into these crevices and things and find something interesting and just yank it out of there uh, much faster than I would have anticipated in, in it's really kind of amazing. You know, uh, one of you ought to tell the story, uh, David, maybe you can, uh, about the octopus using a coconut. Um, uh, this is in Sai's book, and it completely blew my mind that there was a kind of an octopus that could use a coconut and use it in a couple of different ways. You don't think of an octopus really being able to use something like that as a tool. Yeah, so octopuses have a wonderful relationship with man-made objects. And a, a coconut, of course, is a natural object, but but the story of interest is is an, uh, a video that's available on on uh, on the internet uh, quite widely, I think, and um, it it shows an octopus carrying two halves of a coconut that was apparently cut open by people, and this is quite a common object in shallow seas around coconut bearing shorelines, um, and so why would an octopus carry a coconut around? Well. Octopuses need shelter, and th- this octopus is out in a soft habitat where there is not a lot of shelter. And so a coconut is a hard object with room for an octopus inside of it. And so the octopus can just pop into one half of this coconut and then stick out two arms and sort of walk along almost bipedally carrying the two halves of the coconut. And if something threatening comes along, it just pulls in its arms and closes the coconut. <laughs> this is incredible. All right, so we have to take a quick break here. We're going to come back with more of Cy and of David. We're going to talk specifically about uh, the personalities of different octopuses and also how octopuses react differently to different people. Feel free to tweet questions at us or comments at WNPR Colin. On the sea, in an octopus's garden, in the shade, he'd let us in. Knows where we've been in his octopus is God in the shade. You know, before we uh, launch back into this conversation, I want to say uh, Ringo was so far ahead of his time on Octopus Intelligence. Did you hear him sing? He let, he'd let us in, knows where we've been. He knew that octopuses were smart. Uh, yeah, all right. He actually did. He, um, that's how he wrote the song. I learned about this only recently. And octopuses do have gardens. They do, in front of their den, they will sometimes clip the hedges. They move things around. They put, I mean, they don't put like little garden trolls out there, but sometimes they'll choose things to put little tchotchkes around their den. And Ringo Starr <laughs> did know about that. And that's um, why he wrote the song. Way ahead of his time. All right. The voice you hear is that of Simon Montgomery. Uh, she's the author of nearly 20 books uh, for adults and children, uh, and uh, many of them about science and nature. Uh, the new one is The Soul of an Octopus, a surprising exploration into the wonder of consciousness. Also with us is David Scheel, a marine biologist and behavioral ecologist at Alaska Pacific University. He has a forthcoming book on the behavioral ecology of marine animals. So I want to get to this subject, uh, this kind of interactive subject of personal personality uh, in octopuses, or character maybe is a better word. I don't want to use a word that has person in it. Uh, so, um, Sai, one of the things that, uh, and, and this book is many things, but uh, even though Sai is a happily married woman, she's sort of been dating octopuses. So this is sort of a series of <laughs> chapters about various octopuses she's dated. Uh, and so it's clear to you, anyway, that octopuses are different. They have different characters. Um, you want to say a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. Well, it's often reflected in their names. Like at the Seattle Aquarium, there was one octopus who was so shy, they named her Emily Dickinson. She never came out. And then there was one who was the opposite, and so he was named Leisure Suit Larry because his arms were all over you. But their different personalities or characters are so marked that one of our colleagues, someone who uh, David and I had the pleasure of working with in Morea when we were studying wild octopuses there, actually developed a personality test for octopus, which we administered underwater. And I know you must be thinking, well, it's got to be an inkblot test. But no, <laughs> it's not the inkblot test. It was to measure whether your octopus was bold or shy. 
Um, so um, there was also, we should say, uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, researchers who were determined to only give their octopuses numbers uh, would eventually give up and give them names, right? Because they just they just asserted them so much. And wasn't there a cyan octopus known as the bitch? <laughs> Oh, yes. That was at the Middlebury Octopus Lab. A lot of people don't know that Middlebury College has an octopus lab because it's quite small. But um, they were working with with two small species of octopus, and they were so distinctive. Um, One of them was so sweet that this animal would hold its arms up to you like a baby that wants to be picked up. And so friendly and so sweet. But the other one, the bitch... um, always was a problem whenever you were going to do an experiment. When you wanted her to run a maze, she would hide. She would use the net as a trampoline to leap off of, and then she would run around on the floor, and the poor student would rush around like she was chasing a cat. She said it was an absolutely surreal experience. Right. They do cut her, They I do think, run when they get, some of them anyway, do kind of run on their legs kind of, right, when they get on Well, legs. you know what? I haven't seen them do that. I've seen video of them. Um, they can move quite a distance in on on land an alarming distance but i've never seen them actually run and it's not the kind of thing that i want to see because no. you don't want to drop your octopus on the ground but um at middlebury that this wasn't something that they dropped the the animal just launched itself out to get to get away but David has known quite a few octopuses. He's had a, a lab, and he's given them great names as well, even though he's a bona fide scientist. So he sure knows, um, as well as I do, that they're quite distinctive one from another. Well, David uh, Scheel, as a marine biologist, I'm guessing that you would rather talk about their specific behaviors as opposed to their personalities or characters, or, or are those terms that you're somewhat comfortable with? Oh, I'm very comfortable with them. Um... You know, there there was a time when sort of the the standard uh, animal behaviorist rule was don't anthropomorphize your animals, and that that's still a good a good rule. I mean, that means don't think of your animals as people um, because they're not; they're different, and they have they have many capabilities, but they're not the identical capabilities to a human mind. Um, but, but the study of animal personalities has really exploded recently. Um, I was just stunned at a conference, an international ethological conference that I went to in Australia um, earlier this month, how big it has really become in the last 10 years or so. Uh, there, was, there was a time when, when it was debated, should we call these personalities? Is that word too loaded? So we talk now about, we talk about behavioral syndromes consistencies in behavioral tendencies over time and different situations. And pretty much, you know, these, these are widespread in the animal kingdom. I don't want to say all animals have them. All animals haven't been tested. Some animals have been tested and don't show strong signs of them. But, but it's very common to find these. And there have been tests on different species of octopuses that have shown they do have dispositions that are very different. Some of them are very bold. Some of them are very shy. Some of them are exceedingly tactile. Some of them are somewhat hesitant in their, in their willingness to touch. And these tendencies are present from day to day in some cases and uh, over different contexts with food but also with predators. Um, although there was one study that was kind of fascinating that showed that the different individual octopuses had these tendencies, but they, they didn't last, so they had different tendencies on different days. Mood swings, basically. Yeah, mood swings, exactly. So um, I also want to just talk about the reaction to specific people. So, Sai, uh, you, you had your own set of, as I say, relationships with these octopuses, but you also recount some very specific things where it's clear that an octopus treats one person one way and another person another way. So one of the things that octopuses do, either when they're trying to repel somebody or maybe when they're playing, maybe when they're teasing, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, but one thing they do is, as was suggested in our intro, they shoot water out of their uh, funnel. So t- tell us about Truman, right? Truman was the octopus who only did that to one person. Yeah, this was wild. Um, Truman, there was this one woman um, who was a volunteer at the aquarium. And every time Truman saw her, she, he blasted her with freezing cold salt water. And she came to look at it as kind of a greeting. Well, she then went to school and was absent for many months. And when she returned for a visit... She wanted to see Truman, and 
right away, he recognized it was her and blasted her right in the face. So, one, I mean, this is so interesting. It shows that they remember. Two, it shows they recognize individual faces, which has been proven scientifically in experiments by uh, Dr. Jennifer Mather and her colleague out in Seattle, the late Roland Anderson. They definitely recognize individual faces just looking up through the water. Even when people are dressed identically, they can tell who's who. Um, but what kills me is that they, they feel a certain way about you. And when they see you again, they still feel that way about you. And maybe they're grumpy one day and they don't want to play. And we've all felt like that. But I definitely felt, going back every single week to visit the octopuses that I knew, that they recognized me and that maybe they even looked forward to, to playing with me. I certainly look forward to playing with them. All right. So that, that leads us into one of the uh, areas where we really want to go here, and it's in the subtitle of Sarin's book, uh, The Notion of Consciousness. So David Shield, there was a 2012 uh, Cambridge decision of consciousness. Explain what that was and how the octopus plays into it. Uh, the, the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, uh, a group of scientists, uh, some of them quite renowned and some of them uh, just renowned maybe in their field, including, I think, Stephen Hawking, uh, got together and they uh, they made a declaration that uh, animals possessed consciousness and that there was a consensus of scientific information that uh, that animals were consciousness and they 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 indicated that that mammals many mammals possess consciousness that there was good reason to believe that birds possess consciousness. The only invertebrate that was mentioned were octopuses, and they included octopuses in there specifically and said that there's, uh, there's, pro- there's probably less reason than birds, but nevertheless substantial evidence that octopuses also possess consciousness. So when we say consciousness, um, Sally Montgomery, in your book, you reference um, an essay that's a favorite one of ours by Thomas Nagel. It's called What It's uh, Like to Be a Bat, in which Nagel basically argues that we can't know what it's like for a bat to be a bat. We can think about what it would be like for us to be a bat, but we can't really know what it's like to, for a bat to be a bat. So isn't that kind of a stumbling block? I mean, in you've kind of thrown yourself body and soul into the world of octopuses, and you do uh, at one point, I think it's uh, after a, a moment in a Tahitian church, to say that you're absolutely convinced that not only do octopuses have consciousness, but they have something that you are are relatively comfortable calling a soul. Um, but isn't there kind of a wall we have to climb here or that we can never climb? And it's that Nagel wall, the imperviousness of another creature's consciousness. Well, that's true, but so is our own consciousness. I've read entire books by philosophers who say that we don't possess consciousness, that it's a figment of our imagination, a useful fiction. And yet I feel convinced that I am conscious, and I, I think I can say that you're conscious too. So um, I, I accept that consciousness is a, is a thing um, and that it feels a certain way to be conscious versus to not be conscious. Um, but people do debate what consciousness really is, and it's very hard to to measure. And particularly, you know, with you can talk to a person, and that's one way of of finding out what they what they feel like. But goodness, all of us who've ever had a, a difficult relationship with with someone, even someone that they loved, can tell you how hard it is to find out what does it feel like to be you. And and yet, this is. The fundamental thing that we want to know about everyone we care about. Right. So, and I know the kind of people you're talking about who write those kinds of books. You're talking about Patricia Churchland. <laughs> she's been on this show. She's banned from the show right now, but she's been on the show. <laughs> oh, so, um, the, um, but so, like, the Middlebury team that you talk about, I think it's the Middlebury team. For, I think one of the things that one of those researchers says to you, I hope I'm remembering this correctly, is that octopuses are so different that, uh, like, that octopus, the bitch, well, they're trying to get the bitch to uh, participate in a maze test. But I think the researcher says to you, they're so different. We don't really know how to build a maze test that tests them, right? That, that it's, that's how different their consciousness, if that's the right word, is from ours. Yeah, well, I think she's saying that this this test, the maze, that often we use 
to measure intelligence, for example, to David's point, that that will measure just a small tip of the iceberg and that we haven't come up with the way to really see into an octopus's mind yet. But certainly there's no reason to just give up on it because it's a difficult question, right? Right. Oh, absolutely. And uh, look, I'm totally ready to march w- with you or swim with you or, or whatever oh, we're going to do. Oh, I can tell. You're and, jetting right beside right, us. That's right. And, and we should say, I should say, your book has also profoundly affected our producer, Betsy Kaplan, who, although she hasn't really discussed it with her husband, Keith, yet clearly intends to get an octopus. How many gallons? You need 100 gallons? or like? Oh, I know. Well, I mean, you want a pretty big tank. Big tank um, right. I would have wanted a pretty big tank. The reason that I didn't get one is... I opted instead to preserve my marriage. Um, my husband, I go away for months on end, and then my husband is left with these delicate animals to care for. <laughs> so he didn't want to be stuck with caring for an octopus, particularly since the power goes out a lot of times in New Hampshire, and you have to raise live prey for these animals, et cetera, et cetera. But you can get a home octopus, not a giant Pacific, mm-hmm. but you can get a home octopus. And boy, I would love to have one sometimes. So uh, Betsy may be planning to keep the octopus here for all I know. But anyway, um, so, um, you know, David, in in this book, um, you know, there are scenes where Psy, uh, there's one octopus, uh, Octavia, who's moving into what's called senescence, which is really almost like what we think about as uh, as dementia or like a real changing of the brain state that comes with old age. Old age comes fast with octopuses. They live fast and die young, as I says. Uh, but there's a moment, this very touching moment in the book where it seems clear that, that Octavia, even though she's in this state, recognizes sign two of her, of her other keepers uh, in, in, in size words, wants to touch them, to taste them uh, with her uh, with her suckers. She wants to do this, even though she hasn't, I think, experienced any of them in like 10 months or something. A lot of time has gone by. She recognizes them and wants to have an interaction with them. So, you know, going back to the thing that you were saying before about how biologists have changed their attitudes a little bit about exploring the dispositions and urges uh, that animals might be feeling, how comfortable are you with a term like wants, wants to uh, greet and, and touch Sai and two other humans one more time. Is that a word that, that makes sense to you in terms of animal behavior? Oh, you know, in terms of behavior, it's, it's, uh, it's unavoidable thinking about that. I mean, my, when, my, when my daughter was uh, in first grade, she did a science fair project on the wanting behavior of our, our pet bird. We have an African gray bird and uh, African gray parrot. And, uh, you know, she, she she wanted to know, my daughter wanted to know, so she told me, that whether the bird had behaviors that were characteristic of wanting something. Well, you know, what is it to want something? All, all organisms um, need nutrition in order to survive uh, or, or some sort of resources. And so you'll see a bird, for example, that uh, is eager to get to its next meal. Well, a sunflower will turn its face to the sun. Does, does that mean that it wants the sun? So behaviorally, you can see these sort of seeking behaviors. And the real question is, how does the animal experience that? Does it feel the same way that we feel? Um, or does it feel anything at all? And when you, when you have something like a plant, it's hard to make that case, that, that it has awareness of its own uh, you know, actions or the things that it's about to do, the anticipation of its own decisions. When you get to things like a parrot, I think I think there's there's uh, uh, there's no denying that they have anticipation of their own actions, and and I think octopuses do as well. The behavior seems to support that notion, and that that's got to be what it is to want something. Sai, I think you do mention Alex, the famous uh, African gray parrot, uh, in your book about uh, the soul of an octopus. I may have the story wrong. I, th- I, th- I think there was a wasn't there an exchange with Alex and his trainer where uh, Alex said "want nut," you know, and didn't get oh, the yeah. nut, and "want nut," and didn't get the nut, and then "want nut," and then finally, <laughs> Alex went "n u t" or something. Like, like yes, spelled, exactly. Sp- pretty much spelled out nut. Let me this. spell it out for you, you moron! Exactly. Right? It's so great. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I mean, African grays. They're such smart, such smart birds. Only smart people can have an African gray, I think. Um, 
they they frequently also want to know what do you want. One time, um, Alex asked that of his uh, he was staying overnight at a veterinarian's and asked her want nut. She says no. She was working on something. No, I don't want a, a nut. It was after hours and want a shower. <laughs> no, Alex, I don't want a shower. And one after another, he asked what she wanted, and none of these things did she want. And so he finally said, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, we're going to take a break here in just a second, and we are going to uh, explore the uh, um, thorny question of um, how we feel about eating octopuses after all of this. But before we do that, Sai, so uh, it's, it's interesting because we have um, – uh, one of our producers, uh, Josh Nalea, right now is working on a show that we've wanted to do for a long time called The Woo Woo Show because, you know, a lot of things wind up getting kind of categorized as woo woo. They're just they're not scientific enough. It's become a kind of defamatory term, uh, particularly by scientists directed at things that are unproven and claimed. And, and so you're you know, for somebody who writes about science and nature, you're a little bit out on a limb here. Right. I mean, you know, you're or maybe even you feel more than a little bit out on a tentacle. Um, and and I mean, saying that as far as you're concerned, an octopus has a soul. Are, are you worried at all that with a certain part of the scientific community that's going to that they're going to push back at that? Well, what are they going to do? Cut off my arm? I'll just grow a new one. <laughs> That's right. And the one that you cut off will come and get food for you. All right. So speaking of food, let's take a little break. We'll come back. Uh, we'll add one more voice to this conversation as we do talk about eating the octopus. Now that you're an octopus, maybe you'd be happier in a relationship with some other form of sea life, like maybe an anemone. Why would I want to hang around with an enemy? Not an enemy. Anemone. Right, an enemy. Usually I flow away from an enemy or I disguise myself. Anemone is not the same thing as an enemy. You know what? You're getting really weird. You might be getting Rapture of the Deep or something. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kyone Wolf. Greg Hill appeared in the intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Our intern is Nate Gagnon. The part of Bill Curry was played by SpongeBob. For show pages, articles, and Faith Middleton show staff recipes for doctored mock octopus with pork hocks and fetlocks, visit our website, wnpr.org slash Colin. And now, back to Colin. So we all have different ways of relating to a topic like this. And when I first uh, heard that Betsy Kaplan was working on a show about octopuses, I had two reactions. One of them was I, the best octopus I ever had. And see, for Sai uh, or for David, that's like an octopus named Kali or Octavia or something. For me, it's like they serve it at the Aegean Breeze up in Great Barrington. It's terrific. It's delicious octopus. Uh, that's the best octopus I ever had. And I also thought uh, immediately – uh, and this perhaps indicates my own lowbrow uh, relationship about uh, Paul. Paul was an octopus who supposedly could. Uh, well, actually, I'll let Sylvia Killingsworth ex explain this. Sylvia Killingsworth is a managing editor at The New Yorker. Uh, she's uh, written about all this. Uh, she joins us now. Sylvia, remind us about Pulpo Paul. Yes. Uh, the Pulpo prognosticator. Paul, yes. During the 2010 World Cup, um, Pulpo Paul was. Uh, the octopus uh, who correctly predicted the outcomes of all seven of Germany's matches um, by choosing a box. There were two boxes set up, and uh, each of them had the flag of the country countries that were playing um, in addition to a piece of food. And every single time, Pulpo Paul correctly predicted who would win. Uh, and so people believed that, you know, Paul had magical powers. Right, and I was looking forward to Popo Paul's future predictions at other World Cups before I read Sai's book and discovered that octopuses only live three to four years. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's pretty much one and done. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but this raises the the whole conversation that we've been having raises the question of eating these animals, right? I mean, in an animal's intelligence, there's no defense against getting eaten. Pigs are very smart. Um, exactly. So, so Sylvia, how how do we think about this? First of all, I get the feeling people are eating more octopuses, not less. Uh, anecdotally, it is my experience that I've come across more octopus in the last maybe 10 or 15 years sort of out and about at like, you know, modern uh, popular restaurants. I think that's more because of the trendiness of Mediterranean food or uh, Spanish food or French French uh, food as well as Asian cuisine. Uh, but, yeah, I think um, 
you know, it's it's a thing that we're starting to confront. And now that there's all this research on on octopuses and books coming out like size, um, you know, we're sort of starting to reconsider whether this is a factor that we want to consider when we're eating this animal. Well, do you reconsider? And does it make you rethink it? It, it gave me a certain amount of pause. Um, I think it made me sort of rethink why I eat the animals that I do. Um, and generally, my rule of thumb is if it's delicious, if I, if I find it delicious and enticing, then I will eat it. And I think I didn't eat octopus for a very long time because I was a very picky eater growing up. Um, it took me a very long time to come around on even most fish and seafood. And so octopus for me was sort of an outlier. It's It's so unusual. It has all these like tentacles and suckers. It's just, you know, if you think of a six-year-old, you're sort of like, no, I'm definitely not going to eat that. Uh, but the first time I did try it, I was very pleasantly surprised by how delicious it was. And I think that accounts for a lot of the popularity of a lot of modern Greek uh, preparations and Spanish dishes uh, that we see now. Um there's so many lessons we can learn from that. One of them is don't be delicious. Uh, there's, I, there, I think there is a story. I mean, this is, goes back in my mind decades to, I think it would have been the Leakies who were doing research in Africa, and they actually, one of them saw a lion come into the tent and either sniff or lick at one of the other researchers who was sleeping and then kind of make a kind of bleh and turn around and walk out. And you think maybe that's one of the things that allowed humans, who like octopuses don't have the greatest defensive system in the world, uh, to live so long as we don't taste that good. But, sorry, I'm also wondering, wondering if one thing that militates against sympathy for uh, octopuses is and, and, and maybe exacerbates our willingness to eat them uh, is that they're not like us, right? The, if I offered you some braised baby monkey, you're probably not going to be so into it. Does the octopus's strangeness work against it? Well, I I think, yeah, the the cold, slimy part and the suckers part, yeah, I, I think that um, some people might be off put by that. But just about everybody else in the sea will happily eat an octopus. And this is one of the things that has probably sculpted their intelligence, being able to avoid so many different predators who think they are delicious. Um, David Scheel, uh, as a marine biologist, do you eat octopuses? Uh, I, I have done. Um, I try not to eat any that I've known. Um, yeah, I, I suffer from that same fate of uh, en enjoying a delicious meal. So uh, my... I only eat octopuses when they are likely to be a real culinary experience. Uh, I think the last time I had an octopus was about, oh, maybe 10 years ago. Um, so, but, so, Sylvia, this sort of argues for kind of, there's a kind of a sliding scale that's being expressed here, right? That um, we don't really have maybe any kind of ethical framework. Once we decide we're going to eat animals, we don't really have any kind of sensible ethical framework for making discernments about what we're going to eat and what we're not going to eat. Uh -huh. um, well, I think the, the, the particular interesting thing with the octopus is that, um, like you said earlier, one wouldn't probably eat a baby monkey or a pig or some, some other animal that's sort of taxonomically a lot closer to us. Um, than, say, the octopus, which is a lot farther away um, and is so sort of unusual as to constantly be described as something alien. Um, and there's there's a certain sort of uh, like respect at a distance that people have for the octopus, both in observing them as pets or as studied animals um, or, you know, throughout our culture, we have references to, say, like the octopus's garden. Um, Ringo Starr sort of anecdotally says that from an experience in Sardinia he, where these farmers were, uh, or, you know, men at sea were telling him that they saw octopuses uh, decorating their lair. So there's a lot of, like, observed behaviors in the wild that we sort of see and think, you know, that's actually very reminiscent of, you know, humans and consciousness, but they're so far away from us. Um, and that is that it's that sort of decision that something is so unusual as to sort of be respected at a distance and not necessarily, um, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a bowing to this foreign thing. Well, Sylvia Killingsworth, we have to say farewell. We have to say farewell to Cy and David Scheel as well. The book, The Soul of an Octopus, a surprising exploration into the wonder of consciousness was the reason for doing all this. Thanks to everybody who either helped with the show or was a guest on it. Octopus, I love you. I'm so sorry we were fighting, Kion. It's fine. It happens. Let's just listen to our favorite song and get over it. Oh, 
I want to hold your hand, 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 hand. No, Greg, remember, I don't have hands. It's I only have arms for you. And I don't even think I'd do anymore. <laughs>